Hi, everyone, and welcome to AUMA's webinar about running effective virtual meetings. Uh, my name is Rachel DeVos, and I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy with the AUMA. And I'll be moderating today's webinar along with the support of Kelly Santarosa, who's our Senior um, Policy Analyst. And we're really pleased um, that we had such a great turnout uh, for today's session. I think we have about 181 uh, people registered to participate. And I see that um, people are still signing in. And people have already um, started using um, the chat box to say hello to everyone. I think. I think if everybody is, is like me, that we're all kind of missing each other right now. So it's great to even just be in the same uh, virtual space together, even if we can't be in the same uh, physical space uh, together. So um, speaking of virtual space, uh, we know that um, all of you are, are kind of making adjustments uh, to deal with um, the current pandemic. And uh, to start, I just want to make sure that you're all aware of the COVID-related resources we have on AUMA's uh, webpage, which is www.auma.ca forward slash COVID-19. And if you go into the section under Info for AUMA's Member Municipalities, there's information on the support uh, that AUMA's Intrepid IT team can provide in terms of helping you set up uh, conference calls and as well as um, thinking through video uh, conferencing uh, solutions as well. Uh, so don't hesitate uh, to reach out to audio conference at auma.ca if you want help in um, setting up a uh, vendor for either uh, conference calling or video conferencing for your meetings. So with that, and just let me forward the slide. Sorry, I'm not doing a great job of multitasking here today. That's one of the challenges with virtual meetings, I guess, less, first lesson. Uh, so with that, I'm now pleased to get us started by introducing our presenters who have a long history of working closely with elected officials and senior bureaucrats across Alberta to enhance municipal planning, policy, and decision making. Maria De Bruin is a long-standing friend of the AUMA. She has worked with our team on some major initiatives, including our public engagement toolkit, which is available on our website. She has also been a leadership communications and public engagement instructor for the Alberta Elected Officials Education Program. And just to put in a shameless plug for our elected officials uh, program, we are currently exploring options for um, delivering EOEP courses. Um, we are really keen. Maria recently updated um, the public engagement course, and we really are keen to reoffer that. So stay tuned to our website and to our digest to, to, so we can let you know when we'll be reoffering that. And for today's webinar, we asked Maria to join us and share some of her experience and knowledge in supporting the integration of technology into effective meetings. Ian is also no stranger to AUMA members. His company, Strategic Steps, works across Western and Northern Canada on projects that promote principles of good governance. His interests include strategic and sustainability planning, council and candidate orientations, and intermunicipal agreements. Ian is here to talk about the specifics of how councils and administrations will need to adapt to being in different places for council meetings. So I'll now turn it over to Maria and Ian, and I'll jump back on to moderate questions at the end of the presentation. And they might just need to uh, remind me to turn off mute when that time comes. All right, thank you so much, Rachel. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Maria De Bruin, um, and welcome to the webinar. Uh, Ian and I are honored to be with you today uh, to share some of our experiences, insights, and ideas to help you with the transition to, or as the case may be, enhancement of uh, conducting your council board commission meetings virtually, uh, either through teleconference, a web-based platform, or even both. 
So I'll just ask Kelly to take us to the next slide, which is an indication of the fact that this is where we are now, empty rooms with a lot of webcams and phone conversations happening. So today we want to take this opportunity uh, to, to share with you just a quick overview of what has changed um, and what is allowed now as a result of uh, the revisions or updates from the province related to the MGA and its regulations. And we're here to share with you a, a framework for effective virtual meetings that considers how you can get ready, what you can consider, some good practices for conducting those meetings, and how to do all of this in support of transparency and by demonstrating accountability. So to get us started, I'm going to ask uh, Ian to jump in and uh, share an overview of what has changed and what is allowed. And we can go to the next slide. Well, thanks, Maria. It's Ian McCormick here. Um, I'm quite happy to be able to present to this to, to lots of friends of, uh, we've met over the years and quite a few people we know on the list of, uh, of attendees, so it's good to to connect with you all. Um, I've heard a few. We've heard from a few of you since uh, this advertisement for this had gone out, and we, we got a couple of questions uh, listed or provided to us in advance as well. So for those of you who did that, we've tried to incorporate some of the responses to the questions into the text. But if not, we'll certainly respond to them a little bit later on. So in terms of what's actually changed, the MGA remains substantially the same, but the regulatory change that had come out uh, the end of March allows primarily for the purpose of today anyway for public meetings quote to be held electronically. So what that has meant is that Regulation 50 which came out on March the 27th and which you are likely aware of and which AOMA circulated information about has amended meeting procedures in time of, time of COVID and this applies to all council meetings. It also applies to board and commission meetings uh, and, and elsewhere too and we'll just briefly touch on that. It's important to note too that already many of you, if not all of you, have a process to allow one or two of your members to participate remotely, although most of you don't allow remote participation in the in-camera portion of your meetings. And we'll touch on that last point a bit during the presentation. So with the revisions to the MGA regs, uh, municipalities are permitted to hold electronic meetings as long as certain requirements are met. The notifications must continue to be provided an electronic means can be used to make public information, make public any information that the public needs access to for the meeting. So this changes a little bit, of course, because some of you historically may have relied on postings on the door of the town office or on the post box or the postal in the post postal outlet. That changes a little bit too. We've also seen section 606 of the Act modified, so the meaning the meaning of a quote place where it may be held, meaning a meeting can include a website address, a phone number, or other information um, which can be electronically accessed. Previously, uh, ordinarily of course, council meetings had to be held in a physical location. In terms of public involvement, the public must be able to hear the meeting as it's occurring, and the access requirement extends to audio, but video is kind of a nice to have as well. And so some of you are using tools I've seen like GoToMeeting or Zoom or Team have been incorporating video as well as the mandatory audio piece. Where the Act requires information to be available to the public for public inspection, that can be done by making it electronically available on the, on the municipal website. Or sometimes people may request it and you can send information to them by email or by mail, or it still allows you to send it by fax if you're still using that. In terms of submissions to, to meetings, anybody who's ordinarily entitled to make submissions either before or during the meetings can make that, can do that via email or any other method that council or the boards or commissions consider appropriate. And I suspect for most of you that's not a, not a change. As for the attendance at meetings, there are some people who have to be able to attend by electronic means and that for municipalities includes the CAO or designated officer. For commissions or growth management boards or SDABs, that's the chair or vice chair. And for uh, assessment review boards, whether they're local or composite, the presiding officer has to be able to attend. Section 199 of the Act has been modified, so the public and the CAO don't need to be physically in attendance, provided there's an electronic means that permits the meetings to be heard as they occur. 
And any of I've been watching some web meetings over the last couple of weeks, and the CAOs have typically been um, been attending remotely through, often judging by the photos anyway, from their homes. In terms of public hearings, Section 230 of the Act requires Council to hear any person who claims to be affected by proposed bylaws or resolutions, or who wishes to make a presentation. Um, uh, and they, they will therefore have been deemed to have complied with procedures outlined by Council. However, during COVID, any person who is entitled to make submissions will have to do it remotely. And this changes the way that oral submissions are completed and of course has little to no effect on written submissions. The official notification of hearings, the hearing process is covered by the reg and it is the, same, the timelines remain the same as they currently are. Essentially, the business of the community has to continue. Touch briefly on quorum. Um, this is one other change that's not really about the meeting being virtual so much as it is about people who may or may not be in attendance. Uh, if you can't achieve quorum because of quarantine, so the quarantine specifically rather than just self-isolation, your meeting quorum is constituted by the number of remaining members who are not in quarantine, provided that number is two or more. Uh, so this of course could be an issue for summer villages. This is similar to the rules uh, for quorum uh, around pecuniary interest. I'll turn it over to Maria to go to the next slide now, and she's going to talk a little bit about good meeting practice. Thanks, Ian. So one of the most important things to remember is that regardless of whether we're using a teleconference or a web-based platform, uh, the technology that you're using to implement your meeting, it good practice still applies. And that good practice is guided by several principles. And so our next slide offers a few of those principles to keep in mind uh, as you're thinking about uh, preparing for this shift over into the virtual environment or looking to enhance how you're using the virtual environment. Um, so whether you're in a regular council meeting or as Ian had mentioned, um, commission meeting or growth management board, one of the key things is to make sure that there's a clarity of purpose around your meeting um, and having clear outcomes for that meeting, meaning that there are decisions that need to be made. Um, an agenda offers a transparent look at what those outcomes are um, and supports that understanding of the purpose. Um, and it also provides the structure to the conversation so that people know when they see the agenda, uh, that they know what you will be talking about and, and the order in which you'll be talking about those particular uh, subjects. So uh, your procedure bylaw likely has information about your agenda um, and that still would remain in effect and including, um, as Ian mentioned, the submission period for agenda items is maintained and also distribution of those agenda packages, although most of it will likely be happening digitally. Attendance, roles and responsibilities. So there is still an, um, the need to adhere to the MGA and its regulations. And when we're introducing that virtual environment via technology, uh, giving consideration for having the right people there to support the meeting delivery. So um, in this case, you may have some IT resources that are also need to be involved um, more heavily than they have been in the past with in-person. Uh, recording of meetings. So, um, the meeting minutes are still the official meeting record, although we do know that many municipalities are opting to record their meetings uh, and post them, uh, but they aren't considered the official record. However, um, adhering to making sure that your meetings are still available also supports that transparency and accountability component. Uh, timing. So as with any meeting, it is important to keep uh, on time and respect people's commitments and involvement uh, and account for any time to assess the progress of the agenda. So when we're introducing this technology, I'm sure we've all been in the space where we've had some glitches uh, or we've had to um, support uh, participation in different ways and therefore it's taken a little bit longer uh, to to work through particular elements of your agenda. So keeping that in mind and ensuring that you're transparent about uh, being able to accommodate the needs that you have in adapting your technology to support the meeting uh, while still being respectful of people's time and involvement. Rapport is about creating that welcoming environment. And so again, this is just a, a principle that should be happening whether you're 
in person or through uh, the virtual environment, um, just as you would welcome members of the public or your colleagues into an in-person meeting, um, there should be space created to allow for that, those simple courtesies to also be extended in the virtual environment. Um, and then also having a bit of an understanding around that we're, we are in a new realm for some people uh, using new technology, and so demonstrating some patience and compassion and kindness um, will go a long way in um, you and your community navigating these new approaches together. Structured contributions, so ensuring that those who want to speak have a chance to, as outlined in your procedure bylaw, um, and having the chair of your meeting be conscious of this, uh, coordinating delegations and Q&As beforehand, um, that will also help with making sure that you can run on time and support some transparency in delivering the content. Um, and then I've been mentioning transparency and accountability all the way through, but we think it warrants its own uh, recognition here um, so that we, we want to be sure that um, people know about the meeting, they can get involved, that we're sticking with the meeting purpose as we go through it, uh, that you're sharing the outcomes in accordance with your procedure bylaw, the MGA and its regulations. And um, when we're thinking about closed sessions, that we're giving consideration of how those uh, are to be handled uh, in a secure manner um, to be able to communicate to the public of when that's going to be happening and what uh, opportunities they have to be able to understand what their involvement is in those closed sessions as far as when in the agenda item where it would fall so that they are not um, having to enter, uh, leave the meeting and re-enter the meeting. And then finally, continuous improvement. Um, integrating technology into our meetings means that things can go wrong. I'm sure we've all had that experience in the last while. Um, so being willing to learn and adapt so you can improve the next time is a principle that carries through uh, in any sort of meeting format. Our next slide offers, um, with the pr principal foundations in mind, it offers a, a bit of a framework for effective virtual meetings. So uh, we've identified four key phases, plan, act, report, and evaluate, that when followed will support uh, an outcome of effective virtual meetings. When it comes to implementing these uh, meetings, we believe success is 70% preparation or planning, and the other 30% is allotted to that implementation, uh, follow-up, and evaluation component. So I'm going to turn it over to Ian now and move to the next slide uh, so that he can share some key considerations with you as you plan your virtual meetings. Thanks, Maria. And she's absolutely right when she talks about a lot of the, prep, the preparation being the, a really large chunk of, of making these types of virtual meetings uh, successful. We'll start at the procedure bylaw in terms of the rules that municipalities can set. So there could be some impact that you may need to consider in terms of the order of items on your agenda. For example, you might want to put either your in-camera session either at the start or the end of the meeting. And the same would go for public input sessions, so simply because the public may or may not understand why council is disappearing and reappearing. So if it happens once, it's uh, certainly easier for the meeting chair, the mayor, or in rural cases, the reeve, to manage that. So for those of you who have meeting order in your procedure bylaw, this could come up and it could require some bylaw amendments. For those of you who have meeting order in policy, this of course would be easier to change. And so there may be some consideration required in, remove, in moving or removing the order of, item, of items in the bylaw or policy. In terms of pol other policy implica impl uh, implications, there are some of course. So you will have policies on things like records retention. Uh, which will identify how long meeting recordings are kept. And since the audio and video aren't official records, they're still records, but they're not the official meeting record, um, there are uh, records retention issues, that, or not issues, implications that you'll have to consider. In terms of the no notification, you'll want to make sure that there's dedicated space on your website and uh, that there's enough room there to post the agenda and the meeting packages being careful that the in-camera items on those meeting, in those meeting packages are not part of the publicly published or publicly available meeting package. And this is going to be the same whether the meeting itself is happening over the phone or whether it's webcast. 
For meeting procedures, having a declaration of pecuniary interest is something that is likely going to need to be done the same way it is right now. And that may, imply, may mean that the mayor may need to pass the meeting chair to somebody else. So when we get to talking about roles and training that may be required, it may be the mayor and maybe deputy or acting mayor who may need to be able to understand how to manage the meeting from a technical perspective. You may also find that quorum changes if one or more of your members are in quarantine. But as I said before, self-isolation doesn't count. Most of us seem to be in self-isolation at the moment anyway. There are some other implications. For example, choosing a location where you'd participate in the meeting. This, of course, is going to be a different location for all of you. Uh, many of you will currently <clears throat> broadcast or record meetings, but it'd be in chambers as the central point. And now there may be nobody in chambers at all. When you are taking consideration of where to, where to be during the meeting, pick a quiet spot with minimal ambient noise. And for video conferencing, make sure there's natural light if it's happening during the daytime. You'll also find that the closer you are to an internet router, the better. And if you are using the internet elsewhere in the household, if you have other, uh, other adults in the house who are working from home or kids who are learning at school, you may want to think about minimizing the other draws that you've got on your bandwidth to make sure, particularly for video, that that works. That's not as much of an issue, of course, for conference calls. On our next slide, we talk a little bit about roles and responsibilities. So this is the time, basically, where you'll be glad that you have abided by your procedure bylaw over the years, and you'll understand rules of order, because this is the time where you're going to need them. It's, it's a case where the, the mayor or the Reeve and members of council and the CAO aren't uh, sitting beside each other, of course, but are looking at each other on a screen. So some of the cues that will have been available in the past are no longer available. This particularly goes for the meeting chair. So the mayor um, needs to be well versed in the procedure bylaw and in the rules of order. Likely that person would benefit from having some tech savvy and certainly some support because um, they need to know they'll need to know how to run the meeting effectively. They also need to be aware of changes in quorum which are in effect. You may also find as meeting chair that the clerk or CAO may be interrupting from time to time to provide course corrections on procedural matters, whereas before they may have just waved a hand. At this point, they may have to actually interject. For other elected officials, they also must abide by the rules of order more now than ever before, particularly if you want to get council's business conducted in a timely fashion. This, uh, the members of council are all a team, and you know more about your communities than anybody else does, meaning you want to get the business done. If we think about the clerk, and some of you will have a standalone clerk position, a lot of you will not. This person may be acting as the meeting host, and for that reason they must have a way to intervene in the meeting and may be needing to present uh, information and to work alongside inter information technology staff. This may be the person who you want to put in control of the mute button uh, on the phone or video functions if you're using web. Uh, the web to make sure that you can mute people, mute members of the gallery. Most of the tools we've been seeing do have the ability to, to mute people, uh, mute people who aren't supposed to be participating in these public meetings. In terms of the IT support person, that is going to be a critical person now working alongside the clerk. They may be the keeper of passwords for uh, in-camera portions of meetings if you are moving to a different a different virtual space for that, just to make sure that the right people are attending and to remove people who ought not to be there. The recording secretary has a tough job. Um, they're ordinarily uh, documenting decisions, but they may not be seeing people. So they may have to ask for clarity on who may be speaking to, to move or second a resolution or who, or to who may be actually voting or what the, the vote may be. The CAO is, of course, the point contact for administration questions uh, under your, under your uh, procedure bylaw and the rules of order, much as the mayor is the point person for receiving those questions or providing questions from uh, receiving questions from, the, uh, from delegations and whatnot. So that person uh, acts as the point in the hourglass. There are, these are still public meetings, meaning, of course, the public is able to, to watch government in action, but not that they are able to participate in it. According to the Act, the public needs to be able to hear the meeting and follow proceedings. Uh, if they can see the meeting as well, that's a, that's a benefit too. They have to have the opportunity to speak if they're part of a meeting, but not if they're not part of the meeting. 
I'm going to turn it over to Maria now to talk briefly about the, some of the technological aspects and some of the security that's associated with some of these web and phone platforms. Great. Thank you, Ian. So as part of your planning, you'll also want to think about technology and security. Uh, your IT resource is um, your best support to help identify and implement uh, the best platform for your meeting, um, whether that be teleconference or a web-based tool. Uh, they will have a role to play, as Ian indicated uh, previously, to help plan for, implement, um, and share outcomes of your meeting, and most importantly, uh, troubleshoot before, during, or after your meeting. But there are some things that you can do um, to help support your IT resource in implementing a secure meeting. So always making sure that you're using um, the approved teleconference or web-based platform recommended by your IT support. Uh, often in the web-based and teleconference uh, world, we have access codes. So um, trying to avoid reuse of access codes. And if you're noticing that the same access code is being used, uh, raising that question uh, to support a secure meeting. Uh, when the meeting starts, having the chair use a, a roll call or through your web dashboard, uh, being able to um, see and make visual when attendees are joining, um, reviewing and confirming attendance, and uh, identifying uh, generic attendees, so uh, for interest sake, number of members of the public um, to give you an idea of who is um, listening and watching and participating. Uh, and that last piece uh, may not be uh, accessible through a teleconference platform, but in a web-based environment, you may be able to get an indication of how many people from the public are actually uh, being involved in the meeting. Um, as Ian touched on before, um, Sharing, when sharing sensitive information um, such as closed session items, ensure that you uh, are always using devices that are provided by your organization. Uh, and testing your equipment before the meeting with support from your IT resource um, and notifying them of any issues or concerns. Uh, and if you're using a web conferencing system um, to connect uh, close down any other programs, apps, browser windows uh, to save on that bandwidth and support uh, a good connection um, and to eliminate any notifications that might pop up uh, during your meeting. It's important to uh, know your role. So elected officials are there to govern and administrators to manage. So sticking to that governance piece and knowing that your administrators uh, will get the me meeting mechanics worked out uh, is also important to help with a secure meeting. In our next slide, we're just going to touch on a little bit of those processes for technical glitches. So um, testing is very important. So if you're able to, before your meeting, um, have, have that phone call, get everybody online, uh, whatever the, the techno technological mechanism you're using, um, try it out as if it were a real meeting that allows you to test out all of those different buttons, adding or removing people, um, and making sure your administration has that same opportunity or is a part of that test session. Um, you also could set up a test meeting space for anyone to use uh, at any time so that they can go in and practice on their own and become familiar with those features and then ask any questions in advance of going live. Um, creating what we call a snag sheet um, for attendees. So, the clerk in IT can work out any glitches uh, in process or with technology um, moving forward. So being able to document where you may have had some issues and then sharing those back so that the next go around uh, those can be mitigated. And uh, also checking, and this again has to do with bandwidth, but if you're operating multiple webcams for a video conference and uh, you want to test that out ahead of time to, to make sure that there won't be any technical issues uh, associated with everybody having their webcams going at the same time. Uh, if you are having trouble accessing the meeting, um, encouraging all participants to log into meetings at least five minutes prior to the start time to make sure that everybody is connected and any little bugs can be worked out. Um, also, aiming to use the same platform or teleconference service for every meeting so that people are familiar with it um, and hopefully that will help uh, take away any future delays. Uh, if, you can't, if you lose a connection or you can't hear or you can't see the video, um, 
Ian had talked about uh, the clerk kind of being that host person, uh, but having someone regularly monitoring um, attendance to make sure that the people that need to be there are, are connected. Um, and then also having the chair do a check-in with participants before proceeding to the next agenda item to make sure that everybody is still online or connected uh, to the meeting. If there are uh, anybody that gets dropped from a call or uh, loses a connection, having a dedicated phone number and email address for participants to call or text to report that issue and get some support to reconnect. Um, and most importantly, again, sharing a bit of patience. Um, sometimes, with the, especially with the internet connections, if we just wait a few seconds, the connection will catch up again. Or um, you're able, if you have to, leave the meeting and rejoin with the same link and phone number as soon as possible. Um, as far as technical issues with the web platform uh, or teleconference, sometimes those happen and they're actually out of our control. So um, some things that to keep in mind is uh, that we don't want to fret about those. We want to be flexible. So uh, part of preparation is having a plan B in mind. Um, so you may need to do an audio call rather than the video conference that you had planned. Um, and then becoming familiar with the various meeting applications and options when those tech issues occur. Um, and the perfect virtual meeting is really hard to achieve. So be flexible. Encourage participants to become familiar with those meeting applications and find ways to keep them engaged. Um, and you'll have a much more productive, beneficial, and efficient meeting. So moving to the next slide, we are start to move into the action component of our framework. And when we think about enacting our meetings, we want to consider things about how we will actually involve the public, our meeting processes uh, in this virtual space, the etiquette uh, that we should be considering, and um, any implications for other types of meetings such as the closed session, special meetings, or public hearings. So to get us started on the next slide, we'll, we'll delve into the involving the public. And we've got teleconference, video conference, or we can actually do both at the same time. So um, one of the things that we want to highlight is that in each of these platforms, there should be the capability uh, for the host to be able to mute participants. And if it's a video conference, to be able to decide whether or not they would uh, be able to see their video uh, and or use their video. So that uh, capability should be something that you're looking for um, and make when you're thinking about how you want your meetings to run, uh, what, how you want the, that feature to be operated. The other component is the chat and the Q&A. So most of the platforms that we're familiar with do uh, allow you to um, de deactivate those. Uh, so if you are choosing, and your only requirement of course is to have the public be able to hear your meeting, um, then it might be an option for you to deactivate those. Um, if you do have them open and decide to have them open, um, ahead of time letting the public know exactly what those features, um, whether they will have access to the features and how that feature is to be used. Uh, our experience is most municipalities are choosing not to moderate or provide those features um, and being explicit about that with your public so that there is no expectation on their behalf that those are things, any information they're sharing or interaction they're trying to gain through those particular features will be responded to. Um, in, as far as inviting the public to submit questions and concerns, the same uh, applies same practice applies as previous, so they're able to do that uh, through email um, or through the mail. Uh, you can also, depending on um, your practices in the past, make sure that you're looking at the technology and what the best way is to gather that those questions um, or concerns from the public in relation to the meeting. Um, making sure, and I've alluded to this, that they the members of the gallery have a clear understanding of how the meeting will be run and what to expect. So um, one planning piece that we would recommend is that that, may, that conversation happens before and that that information is posted to uh, the website that has your meeting uh, package and the connection information for the public. So it's a bit of an FAQ about um, 
what the public's role will be and uh, what they can expect, uh, what will be talked about, so that there's some clarity ahead of time and, the, and we're not setting expectations that through these particular uh, environments that they would have more opportunity to interact with council than, than is actually the case. Um, when we are talking about uh, also providing tips to the public, a slight tip sheet about their involvement and how uh, it would support them is to give them some reminders about um, tips, as I've shared with you, around helping to minimize broadband um, and to make sure that they, if they are part of a, a delegation, for example, um, or they are participating as part of your public input session, that they know um, to do things like turn down any uh, radios or TVs that they may have when it's their opportunity to communicate with council, um, and they have a good understanding of what that interaction will look like. So a tip sheet can go a long way to support uh, their interactions with council in that regard. I'm going to turn it over to Ian now to talk a little bit about meeting processes as you're enacting the meeting. So we'll move to our next slide. Great. Thanks very much, Maria. Um, and thanks also for the questions that are starting to come in too. That uh, We'll try and incorporate some of those questions as we go. And hopefully I know some of the questions, most recent ones, will, we will actually get to as part of our agenda topic anyway. Uh, well, we talk, we talk generally a little bit about uh, the tools that are some of the tools that are available and some of the technical pieces. Fundamentally, we are still holding uh, regular council meetings or special council meetings. The, the, pro the meeting process will try and keep as similar as possible to the way it is right now because that's how people know it and expect it. So typically the mayor or if in the case of committees would open the meeting and poll councillors or committee members prior to calling the meeting to order to ensure quorum is present. And if you have to explain why quorum has changed, uh, that would be a time to do this too. When we are doing this on a web-based tool with video enabled, of course we can see who's present. Uh, you won't necessarily be able to do that if video is not used in places with lower bandwidth or when you're using a teleconference and not using video. At the beginning of the meeting, it would be really helpful to state that the meeting is being recorded and note that the voices and the faces of people present may be on that recording so people can choose whether or not they want to participate that way. It's useful if the mayor would have a script of likely motions that are going to be prepared in advance. That way it can support an efficient debate. Uh, if we want to request a resolution or to transition between agenda items, uh, the re meeting will run more smoothly if we have a, a real approximation of how things are going to go. Acknowledging, of course, that when it comes to debate and making resolutions and amending motions, that's going to change things a little bit. We have a democratic right to be heard as elected officials, of course. So in that, while things are happening in terms of the agenda, to have, to have that uh, debate, the mayor can either ask each individual councillor if they have comments on the agenda item that's being reviewed, uh, ensuring in that way that councillor has the opportunity to speak, and in this way following the debate rules that you've got laid down in your procedure bylaw about who speaks, when, how often, that sort of thing. You could also have the clerk keep track of debate, for example, how often a particular member speaks to a topic in association with the rules outlined in the procedure bylaw. And this will support efficient debate and meeting timelines. You can also have the clerk or the recording secretary or the CAO, if you're a really small uh, community, keep track of movers and seconders and the order of motions, particularly so that nested motions don't get too confusing and don't get lost and we understand what we're continuing to debate on. Uh, even more so than necessary, written motions will be necessary because for those of you who have used a, an LCD projector to write handwrite motions and project them on a screen or a wall, you won't be able to use that. They will need to be written somehow. Your request for decisions, uh, many of you will use that format, could certainly contain alternative motions uh, drawn up in advance. Many of you, as I mentioned, use that now. And remember as elected officials that your administration needs action, needs a resolution at the very least for action to occur. If you want to signal the end to debate, a uh, mover and seconder can typically close debate as a signal that we're moving on to a vote. 
And some of you may already be using electronic voting, but you probably won't be able to make that work in a virtual meeting again because that technology is probably centered in your council chambers rather than on whatever online tool you're using. Now the tools may adapt to that a little, a little bit too. Somebody asked specifically about voting, so here's where we get to some of the questions that you have. The mayor should do a roll call before asking for a vote to ensure that all members have been able to enter into debate. We'll find with technology that sometimes technical glitches may have prevented a member from being heard. And much as you like to, might like to accidentally silence some of your colleagues, don't do it. When the mayor calls for the vote, um, he or she can either ask for a show of hands if the meeting is on video, and that seems to be from the meetings that I've watched the way it's working. Or the, the mayor or chair can poll each individual member of council asking for a verbal response. Uh, some of you uh, could, if you're using electronic voting through whatever platform you're using, things like Zoom, for example, give you the opportunity to raise hands or using a similar feature, which you could do anything that clearly signals uh, either voting for or against a resolution, or in some cases, of course, not voting at all. We have been hearing of some telephone meetings where just negative responses are being requested, assuming of course that no response is a yes vote. If you use this process, that does need to be in your procedure bylaw. Uh, you wouldn't need to do that if you were on video, of course. And depending on the bylaw or on the council member's request, you can still do recorded votes and post the record online and in the minutes. Some of you will do that by default, and some of you will retain the MGA requirement for just, post, just taking recorded votes upon request. When you have delegations speaking to council, that's for presentation, of course. Useful, uh, almost essential now, to have the presentations provided ahead of time so that people can see them. The, the clerk or whoever is in charge of the, the meeting can either open the video to the delegation or open the audio to the delegation so that that screen share and the presentation can be shared uh, and the delegation, can, the delegation can present to Council. We've talked a little bit about in-camera, but should there be an in-camera session, and many of you will use this quite regularly, uh, there are issues associated with security and privacy and in-camera which certainly aren't there in, during a regular or special meeting, uh, open session anyway. So when you are engaging in in-camera or closed portion of the meeting, ensure that you're in a private space where no one else can either hear participants, hear you or other participants during the session. This, this can be explained to the gallery who's watching because they will, may wonder why all of council has disappeared. We have run into times where people think the meeting has ended, pre, uh, gallery members think the meeting may have ended prematurely when in fact it has not en ended. If you put the in-camera session towards the, or at the end of your agenda, this may not be as much of an issue. Sometimes they think that they're being precluded from being involved in democracy, uh, even though in reality they're just being prevented from viewing the in-camera portion of the meeting. If you are putting in-camera through the middle of the meeting someplace, if you can give an idea of when open session might resume, that would be useful for people who are in the gallery. Um, so just mostly for the convenience of those people tuning in. There is no real assurance about who is sitting behind the camera uh, if you're sitting in your office space. So you know whether you're alone or not. You don't necessarily know whether your colleagues are alone or not. You could ask for an oath or an affidavit uh, in advance of, of the meeting to make sure that people understand how important it is that they are in, in, uh, in private. You could put this down into, is this, if this continues, into your code of conduct bylaw as well. Uh, particularly if you're going to continue with virtual meetings after the crisis has passed and if the regulations don't get reverted back to the way they are now or were before. So choosing a location is where you know you're alone, such as a room that has a door which can be closed in it. Uh, when possible, we've mentioned re refrain from using the computer speaker. Uh, wearing a headset or earbuds will help with confidentiality as well. And some web platforms that you are using allow for breakout rooms, meaning it's possible to place member of members of council and other relevant personnel in a separate room to engage in the session. And your IT support can probably help with this. If the IT support person is to be part of in-camera, because they need to be there for support, you'll need to have some assurances of security with that person too. But also remember as a note of caution that this is the digital age and that no system is completely immune to hacking. 
we've, we've heard of, in, in Zoom anyway, of uh, people inadvertently being included within meetings when they ought not to be. Uh, I think with the use of things like waiting rooms now where there's more control over who attends a meeting, that seems to be, uh, be dealt with as much as possible. When we think about how the public is involved in meetings, that may have to change as well. Some of you now allow individuals to speak uh, to council during a meeting on either, typically it's either any topic of a municipal jurisdiction or any item on today's agenda. So they can still do that, but you'll just need to control how that happens. You'll follow your procedure bylaw, but you may, uh, those of you, uh, lots of you don't require people to, to sign up in advance for that, but you may need to start doing that so we know from technological perspective uh, who can, we, the way we can test the, test the technology with the presenter. You want to be limiting the person, the, the time for each person to speak. And that person, of course, will have to be given access to an open microphone, of course, and maybe an active camera as well. This isn't the time for debate. Uh, council questions should be limited to just questions of clarification. I'll turn it over to Maria for some comments on meeting etiquette now. Great. Thanks, Ian. So on our next slide, we've just uh, got a few highlights for you. Um, one of the biggest things to remember is to be on time. So we are in a new virtual environment for some of us, so um, that technology can be a bit glitchy. So connecting a bit before the start time of your meeting is appreciated to be able to mitigate any concerns uh, that you might have or issues that may be happening and to allow the chair to be aware of who is actually in the room before getting started. If at any point you do need to leave the meeting, so notifying the chair as you normally uh, would is, is also good practice. Um, we had an opportunity to hear from our colleagues in uh, Westlock County, and they've established a couple of tips as well that we um, have integrated here around etiquette and being aware of the fact that uh, Pre-meeting chats do happen um, typically in a normal face-to-face -face, uh, meeting. So just being cognizant of the fact that um, during those pre-meeting chats, we want to be as courteous and respectful to each other as possible, keeping in mind that there may be members of the public or the press that are actually online um, when those pre-meeting chats are, are taking place. Uh, and the, some of the challenges around um, using the technology is often the delay, so having some crosstalk um, or other ambient sounds like um, shuffling papers in the background uh, can be quite distracting. So um, just being respectful of the fact that there may be a delay in speakers and uh, trying to eliminate talking over one another or even um, uh, be having any sort of side conversations uh, if you're, all of your microphones are open is uh, recommended. Uh, when you are speaking, um, identifying yourself when you do speak, uh, particularly on those conference call meetings, um, inviting members of the public. You may all recognize one another's voice, but members of the public likely will not. Uh, and also being sure to speak as clearly as possible um, and confirming that the, that the participants can hear you. Uh, if you're in the video environment, uh, keeping body movements with video minimal so people can actually focus on what you're saying and not how you're saying it. Um, and for web-based meetings, maintaining uh, eye contact, uh, looking at the camera just as you would in a face-to-face -face conversation. Um, and then identifying yourself and others. So um, when turning over the floor to a counselor um, to speak, the chair should identify that that counselor, so supporting one another to make sure that people do know who is speaking at what point in time. On our next slide, we just have a few more uh, etiquette tips. So of course, we've talked a lot about the, the mute button, but it is best to mute your microphone to help minimize any background noise or that might make it difficult for people to hear the person that is speaking. And minimizing distractions. So uh, distractions can have a significant impact uh, when you are participating uh, in these meetings. It might be tempting to think that just because you're not in the same room with your 
colleagues. Um, they won't notice that you might be scrolling through your phone or composing an email on another screen. Um, but it, it does have an impact, especially if those distractions mean that the organizer or the chair has to go back and repeat information that's already been shared. Um, so to reduce those potential distractions and stay engaged, make sure your phone is on silence if you're if you're not using it to call in, obviously. If you are calling in on your phone, try not to work on other things like your computer. Um, and if you're using a web conferencing system to connect, closing down any other applications uh, or browser windows that may be distracting. Uh, your attire and your location. So I think Ian mentioned about location and trying to find a quiet space. Um, in location, also facing a, a window or being able to expose to plenty of light if you're in the web-based environment and using your video. Um, and then dressing the way that you would as if you were meeting participants in person. Although many of us are in a much more comfortable environment in our homes, um, our attire does convey a level of professionalism. So it's important to remember that. And giving some grace. So being courteous to other participants as this is really new for everyone. I will now turn it over to Ian to talk about uh, the other types of meetings. Thanks, Maria. So uh, some of you have asked about different types of meetings and, and public hearings and whatnot, so we'll get to that at this point too. When we talk about council meetings, the definition of meeting itself, of course, doesn't appear in the MGA. And many of you don't have a definition within your procedure bylaw either. However, typically we've been using it as a quorum of members at which municipal business is discussed. So being careful how you and your colleagues gather, even virtually, uh, what might comprise a meeting is something to take care of. Uh, these are the types of meetings that we're addressing as part of this uh, session today. Thus far, we've talked primarily about regular meetings, but the changes that we're seeing to the regulation also apply to other meetings of council members too, as well as to boards and commissions. They also apply to growth management boards and other bodies, but we're not really speaking to that today. In terms of in camera, we've dealt with that quite a lot. So I'll just add a couple of things to that. Just that this is an issue even now uh, and when, when municipalities allow members to participate remotely if, for example, they're out of town during a council meeting. If you have a procedure for remote, uh, remote participation in in-camera meetings, uh, just continue to follow that. If you don't have a procedure, consider how to create it based on some of the things that we have talked about today, either through policy or bylaw. And of course, this could be part of your code of conduct bylaw. Conducting a, the roll call of members and anybody else who's allowed to be in the in-camera portion and asking them whether they can be overheard is a way of providing a little bit of due diligence to this as well. If you are on video, of course, you can see who's participating. So whoever has got control over the meeting technology can ensure that those people who aren't supposed to be there aren't there. It's a little bit harder to do, of course, when you're on a teleconference and can't see who's there. Uh, you mentioned your IT support may actually have to be part of uh, in-camera meetings now too. In terms of special meetings, there's really no change from what currently happens except the meeting is being held uh, virtually. You can still only discuss what's advertised and you must provide appropriate notice to the public, although the notification process can be virtual now uh, as well. If we speak briefly about public hearings, they, happen, they continue to happen within the context of council meetings. The new regulation speaks to advertising of the hearing and conducting the hearing. And be very clear for those of you who are running meetings uh, that you are, when you are moving back and forth between the, the, the official hearing and the regular council meeting, be clear that that differentiation is happening for people who are unfamiliar with the process and they may not understand why you're moving from one meeting to another. So in this case, the mayor may need to be even more clear about why council moves from one type of meeting to another and then back again. So people who are watching or listening can understand the process. When it comes to committee of the whole or priorities committee or whatever you're calling it, it would still work the same way and be similar enough to regular council meetings that the rules would be the same. However, um, being sure that if there are groups who are presenting to council that they can see, hear, speak, and respond. Uh, see, of course, part of video, hear, speak, and respond being part of the audio, audio piece. There are changes that apply to boards and committees too. So if you have municipal boards and committees, they too can meet virtually. And the rules for them apply as the rules for council apply. This is true for boards like S uh, subdivision development appeal boards that they need to continue on so that development can continue through the normal timelines of the regular appeals process that's available to them. 
When it comes to emergency meetings, particularly now, the process remains the same, but getting that technical setup working properly on really short notice can be a challenge, particularly if it's now the first time you're doing it. And for large rural municipalities, uh, so that doesn't apply to AUMA as much as it would to, the, to, to rural municipalities, but some places which have spotty internet access or, or limited bandwidth may have issues with video conferencing and may still want to rely on a phone meetings being the best option. Our next slide is talks a little bit about accountability and transparency. And, uh, Maria had referenced these a little bit too, but just some notes about the public may not know why things are being done in a particular order in a council meeting. This isn't their, their full-time career or even their part-time career in such a way that it is for, for many or most of you. So some explanation of the order of business would be helpful. Uh, applies for in-person meetings and more so for virtual meetings where normal clues or non-verbal non cues may be missing. This could add a bit of time to your meetings to the start. Uh, we'll get used to it, but it'll also provide extra clarity. When it comes to recording votes, uh, your procedure may call for them or it may not and continue with the practice that you currently use. And knowing, of course, that the meeting minutes remain the official record and whether, uh, whether or not a vote is recorded will, show, will not necessarily show up there in the same way it would show up on a video recording or an audio recording that you might be keeping. When you're being truly accountable, you're talk, documenting your decisions and the rationale for why those decisions was made, and that continues to be necessary. Uh, you, all elected officials have a chance to speak, and when this is done verbally, the mayor needs to keep track of the rules of debate so everybody gets a chance to be heard and so that nobody monopolizes the airtime. Our second slide on accountability starts a bit with recording uh, meeting minutes. And uh, Maria referenced this, but the recording secretary may or may not be able to see the people who are speaking, moving, seconding, and may require some assistance in identifying who those people are, particularly if they're using uh, points of procedure or points of privilege, which aren't, tip aren't normal part of most meetings. And these, these written minutes do still represent the official record, so need to be done appropriately and correctly. In the past, you may not have had to save and post your audio or video before if you've not met virtually or through the web. Um, have you considered or you will need to consider hosting these meetings on your website or maintaining them? If it's new, you may require some technical assistance on how to, re how to maintain these recordings over the amount of time that they last. To the best of our knowledge, you don't have to post the audio and video because it's not the official record, but it has become common practice across the country, particularly for local governments that have said they have values like accountability and transparency. If this, it does represent a change for you, it could be an update to your procedure bylaw or a records retention policy that you need. Your meeting rec recordings, whether they're audio or video or both, are records like any other and they're subject to your records retention policy. So while your meeting minutes themselves have to be retained in perpetuity, the audio and video does not, unless of course your bylaws uh, require it to be so. As we look towards the end of the meetings and getting close to the end of this webinar as well, we talk about evaluation and debriefing. We recognize, and Maria has said this too, actually next slide if we could, there's always room for improvement. And well, there we go, thanks. There's always room for improvement. And Maria mentioned snag seat sheets at the beginning. This is the time to start looking back at what worked and what didn't. So a quick debrief email after the meeting uh, will go a long way to supporting continuous improvement and making things better for next time and making sure you maintain and continue to keep meet your legislative ob obligations. If you've got your snag sheets out, making you get, as you get more used to the, the virtual meetings, uh, the list, the items on these snag sheets will become fewer and fewer uh, as we begin to track things in terms of technology and process to get in the way of meeting, uh, conducting a smooth council meeting. We think the council meetings will likely last a little bit longer to start with, but then as they become more streamlined, they will begin to, uh, begin to speed up again. Our last uh, major slide here is about things to remember. And just a bit of a, a refresher of some of the things we've talked about, noting that this is new for everyone. So try and be creative and limit and try different things until you find the right fit for everybody. We know that the process won't be perfect, especially the first time out, but you can up your odds by testing the process before going live. We know the government's about relationships. This is a people business, so you're there to make your communities thrive, and the technology is really just there to support you, so don't be in a rush. And make sure that you and your fellow counselors and staff are comfortable with the technology that's being used, 
and try, try it out and make sure you find what best suits your municipality's needs. Let people know about the changes in meetings via newsletters, your social media feeds, newspaper columns, the same way you do currently. And reach out to other municipalities who are already implementing virtual meetings to find out what works and what doesn't. Most of these meetings, because they are public, are advertised on websites, and you can peek in on other municipalities' council meetings to find out what works and what doesn't. So with, uh, if we move on to our last slide, just to, with a bit of any of the time we've got left, we'd be happy to, pr to respond to any questions you've got. But before we do that, this is just a, a reminder that the webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the AUMA website, uh, I think. And if you want to review it or pass along the link to your colleagues, that's certainly doable. We have created an infographic tip sheet based on the contents of the presentation and based on participating in actual virtual council meetings. That sheet will be, I believe anyway, it will be distributed to those of you who are participating today, and you could pass it on even further than that if you like. And I believe AMA may have it on their website at some point, and Marie and I will certainly put it on our sites. We, our contact information is here, and if we don't get to questions today, you're, we are more than happy to hear from you after the session. And with that, with a couple of final comments, we'll just do right at the very end. But before that, I'd turn it back over to Rachel as the moderator. Thanks very much, and thanks so much for everybody who has um, typed in questions already. I think um, since um, we're, we've already got an hour, what we'll do is answer the questions that have been typed in already, and then, but. Um, I encourage everybody on the line um, to um, keep, keep uh, typing in your questions. And for those that we can't get to on this call, um, Ian and Maria have uh, graciously offered um, to provide answers in writing, if that's still all right with you, Ian and Maria. So yes, certainly. Awesome. So to kick things off, uh, from uh, Richard Poole, he has a question that um, after first reading of a boring bylaw, it starts a timeline that town citizens can if they choose to start a, a petition. Under the MGA, this petition needs to be signed and witnessed in order for it to be valid. How do communities allow or facilitate this when COVID regulations do not allow interactions between individuals? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Uh, you know, without I don't want to don't want to speak out of turn on this, but I'm, that might be one of those questions we might want to do just a little bit more research on, if that's okay with you, uh, Rachel. Yeah, before that's we good. before can, I respond, unless Maria can... knows off the top of her head, or you do. No, no. That one might be one where we need to reach out to um, municipal affairs about it. And I would say the same for any of the questions here too. If there are people who haven't participated or aren't able to participate, even if we get to them now, we can still respond in writing as well. Awesome. That sounds great. Yep. So our next question is from Ren. What do you recommend for inviting the public to listen? Webinar, conference call info, advertise on the municipal website, ask residents to call email admin to get link or phone number and access code. I know you addressed this a little bit, but maybe just to emphasize mm -hmm. um, some of the best practices you're seeing out there. Do you want to comment, Maria, or do you want me to? Uh, no, you go ahead. The, if, you, if there's a principle of meeting people where they are for local government, um, physically as well as, as virtually, the best way to do it is as, as many ways as possible. So if you are using a teleconference, putting the information about the teleconference number and if there is a password, putting that on the municipal website. You could also have that as part of the, at the top of the agenda packages as well if you like. If you're using a video format, something similar, a link posted on the municipal website, a link listed on agenda packages. Uh, if you're using social media feeds, if you've got a Facebook page or Twitter accounts, having, providing information out that way as well. In many, many ways, it's just a virtual representation of the same way you do things now. The, with the additional security that seems to be now starting to show up on some of these phone calls and video, uh, it may require a password as well as just the, the normal link to either a video or a phone number to dial in. Though. So just, again, sticking with making it as broadly, as broadly publicly available as possible. 
For some smaller communities, it may even include stapling it up on the community bulletin board, recognizing that that's not virtual, of course, but the meeting does continue to be virtual. Great, thank you. So then there's a bit of discussion about mute buttons. So maybe I'll combine all of the discussions that went on. So first, uh, Myrna asks, small communities with only one staff, who should have control of the mute, um, et cetera, of the meeting, CAO or mayor? And um, there was a, um, there's a, a related question from Sabine, is it advisable that the recording secretary is in charge of the mute button? And, and Melanie did jump in to say, depending on the system, sometimes you can have multiple people control mute and that Zoom, um, Zoom allows multiple. So, so maybe, um, yeah, we can start with, it is tricky with when for those small communities that only have one, uh, one staff uh, to kind of multitask. I know I have challenges multitasking, so any advice? Marisna, I'll mention this too. My suggestion would be whoever's acting in the role of clerk be the one who maintains the, that. That may well be the CAO if it's a small community with only one staff person. Uh, I, would not leave, I would not provide it to elected officials because they are concentrating on their governance role, whereas in terms of actually keeping the meeting running, to me that's more of a management or administration role. So whoever's acting as clerk. The issue with the recording secretary might be that that person is trying to keep track of what's happening in the meeting at the same time. I recognize that might also be the case for the clerk and the CAO, but to me it would be a role that I would see a clerk taking on. I don't know if Maria wants to add to that. No, uh, that, the, no not at all. Uh, the, I think the clerk position would be the most advisable. And again, Myrna asked, and you did, um, I could see that you were following along with the questions, and you did address this to an extent. How do you ensure that in-camera sessions only have the individuals um, that should be attending? And I don't know if you have any comments about, you know, this might be easier a little bit on a, on a video conference call than that might be one of the limitations of an audio conference where you don't have any visual cues to kind of confirm who exactly is in the room or on the call, yeah, so, I should say. Yeah, so I think we did mention um, the roll call aspect of the chair, ensuring doing a roll call, especially in the teleconference environment. Um, and there's, uh, I think Ian had mentioned some platforms have the opportunity for breakout rooms where you'd be able to monitor who is in that particular room. Um, and there are some teleconference platforms that also enable um, you to put uh, members of the public or people that wouldn't be participating in that meeting in a hold position. Um, so it really is a matter of looking at your technology options to figure out which would be uh, the most secure uh, way, uh, given, given what's out there right now, to support that um, secure conversation amongst the members. And Ian, I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add on that. No, I think it's, it is a certainly an easier thing to deal with when you can actually see somebody or even a black screen that somebody's there. When you, can, when you can't see somebody, it's almost a negative option by asking who's not here. It can be quite awkward to do. So it could also be a separate conference call number uh, for, um, for, uh, for elected officials or people who are supposed to be participating in the closed section of the meeting, which is why if it happens at the end of a council meeting, it might be easier to, to deal with that. You could essentially end the public portion of the meeting and reconstitute a call uh, with a limited number of people or a different number uh, for, the, for the teleconference. If it's just the video conference, then you could close the video conference to people who aren't supposed to be there. And Charlotte, I believe that um, we touched on public hearings, but feel free in the group chat if, if you had a further questions um, to ask any further, um, anything further with regards to public uh, hearings. And then I think Deb just had a helpful uh, tip that, um, that Zoom has recently changed some of their privacy setups to automatically be set to require the person joining to enter the ID number and you'd have to manually tick it off to not require this. So I think that's 
that's just one of those things that's helpful in terms of really confirming um, who's there and, and having more control. So the next question is from Michelle. Are there best practices for distribution of closed meeting materials? When can they be distributed, distributed relative to the meeting time? And is there a need to collect materials back? So many of you will, will uh, be dealing with this right now uh, because many of you, if you're holding webinars, uh, sorry, not web-based web meetings, uh, will have virtual meeting packages already. So it, that would be laid out in your procedure bylaw. It would be to follow the bylaw too. The, there is, there, uh, for closed meeting agenda items, as they are distributed now, they ought to be continued to be distributed. Uh, a lot of, some of you will be doing that virtually now. Some of you will be doing it still in hard copy. It almost all needs to be, it could be mailed out, I suppose, if it's far enough in advance. But I think most of the time it would just be uh, part of the code of conduct or part of the procedure by bylaw that says those materials must be destroyed once, they're, once, you are compl once you're done with them. Because there's no point just emailing them back to the, to the clerk or the CAO because there still is a copy that retained, that's retained on your, uh, on your system. So it may be some, some training that's required on how to actually completely cleanse a system of some of that in-camera information. Great. Thank you. So the last question we'll take for now is from Verna. Does a virtual meeting of a council committee still need to have a designated officer in attendance at each virtual meeting, along with the members and any other required staff? So I was just, uh, in anticipation of the question, I had a quick look at the regulation, um, AR 50-2020. And it talks about the public meetings being held electronically, and it specifically deals in there with councils, commissions, growth management boards, and assessment review boards. So it doesn't actually speak to council committees themselves. So the negative option on this would, would appear to be the answer is no, but I'd like to just do a little bit more of a look into that rather than just my superficial reading right now. Maybe we'll respond to that one in, in writing as well. So the, the designated officer wouldn't have to, wouldn't have to be there. Great, thank you so much for that. And I see we have had a few other um, people entering questions, but I also see that we're starting to lose people. Just, so just out of respect um, for people's time, we'll maybe wrap up here and commit to loop back with everybody with, um, with the answers to questions um, that people have. We'll also, what we'll do is we'll leave um, the uh, we'll leave the webinar open so that you can continue to type in your questions and we can um, copy and paste those questions out of the chat box and make sure we get those answered. Um, but I just want to give a, a huge thank you to Ian and Maria for um, providing this valuable information for all of you uh, for uh, joining us and for the um, excellent active participation and the excellent questions. And before we close off, just a, a last reminder, if you do need help in terms of um, setting up uh, a conference call solution or audio conferencing solution, uh, you can email audioconference at auma.ca. Make sure you're uh, visiting our COVID-19 webpage. And if you have any questions or, or other um, comments on, on this webinar or anything else that, that AUMA is um, doing right now, you can always at email advocacy at auma.ca. And with that, uh, I hope everybody has a safe, and healthy weekend and thanks again for joining us today and kelly you can stop uh recording thanks so much <laughs>